Hi everyone, this is Justin Gray from Synthesis Sound and Immersive Mastering, and this video is going to be focused on how I use Pentio Pro Plus to decorrelate audio within my immersive music mixing practice. Before I move on, I'd like to encourage you, if you want to stay in touch or learn more about my work as a mixing and mastering engineer in stereo and immersive audio formats, specifically Dolby Atmos and Sony 360, please feel free to visit one of the websites at synthesissound.com or immersivemastering.com. I'd also like to encourage you to subscribe to the channel. I've already got quite a few videos over the years um, dedicated to music production, specifically in the area of immersive audio, like Dolby Atmos. And so those videos are there if you haven't seen them. And I have been working on a project of my own for the past couple of years. It's called the Immersive Project, and it's a record that I composed for, conceived of, produced, orchestrated, recorded, specifically for immersive audio. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it later in this video because I'm going to use an example at the end of the video to compare multi-channel microphone array technique recording to the use of Pentio for generating uncorrelated and decorrelated sound. Um, I'm at the mix stage now of that record, so it's not quite ready to be shared with the world, but I do intend on sharing quite a lot about the process of the creation of the music and the mixing of the record, uh, etc. through this channel. So uh, if that sounds exciting to you, please subscribe and keep in touch. So in this video, I'm going to start off shortly by just exploring Pentio, the new update that was just released. There's some really key features in there that I'm very, very excited about. And there's a couple features in there that I worked with Jeffrey and the team to develop uh, that I'm excited to share with you and explain what they do and, and sort of my intent behind how why I was using Pentio this way and why I continue to. Following that, I'm going to go into, I don't know, more of an academic exploration of the concept of decorrelation, the importance of understanding it within the context of immersive music production. Also some discussions about just the art of immersive audio and how all of this fits in. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to open up one of the sessions from the Immersive Project, not necessarily to play the full songs, but to use some of those elements which have been recorded with extensive microphone techniques to then compare with Pentio so we can hear and see what I use Pentio for uh, when I don't have access to that uncorrelated recording content. As a brief introduction before I pull it up, Pentio Pro Plus is an upmix and downmix plugin. Now, these have existed, and actually when we think about, you know, even the idea of turning mono content into stereo, this kind of processor has been around, and Pentio has been around for quite some time now, doing very, very important work. Uh, and I'm going to talk more when I'm doing the examples of how it sort of came into my practice. One of the things that Pentio Pro Plus brags and rightly so, is, is the phase coherent nature of its decorrelation algorithm. And that is very, very crucial to the success of what this plugin is capable of. It was really initially designed, from my perspective, for format conversion, going from, let's say, 5.1 up to uh, an immersive 714, as an example, or possibly going from a 13 channel to a Dolby Atmos uh, speaker array Channel, bay, channel count, or ambisonic formats coming into stereo or binaural. And, and so even though that's what it was designed to do and it does very well, I started using it very differently right from the onset, and I'm excited to show you that. There are a couple terms that I'd like to clarify, uh, and I'm going to do so in this video. One is upmix, one is downmix, and one is remix. Now, I'll save remix for later, but the idea of an upmixer, what does it mean? Well, to my understanding, and I think to many of us in the industry, it is the idea of taking information that was contained in a certain number of channels, typically two, or sometimes in film, even like a, a 5.1 or even just a 5.0, and then expanding that to a larger channel count. A very, very common practice is two channels to 714, as an example, um, or even leaving the LFE out of it, and so two channels to 11 channels, or five channels in the film world, getting a five channel stem and then needing to upmix that to an 11 channel stem or beyond. So 
Those are some examples of upmixing. Now, the downmix is the exact opposite of that. It's the fold down. It's the algorithm saying, okay, I've got this much content, let's say an 11 channel uh, speaker based mix, and I need to now turn that into a 5.1 or six channel speaker based mix or down to a two channel mix. And so those concepts of up mix and down mix um, really do relate to this practice. I've heard the term up mix being used when related to Dolby Atmos mixing of content that comes from stereo derived productions. And I just believe that that's an incorrect use of the term. That's not an up mix. As I'll explore later, uh, it's a remix. It's a spatial remix. That's what I call it. I know that that's not a universally used term, but I really do think that when we're talking about up mixing, we're talking about a decorrelation process related to a tool like Pentio Pro Plus. So let's jump right into some of the new features. Here we are looking at the new release of the Pentio Pro Plus plugin. Now, I've got it in a Pro Tools session. So this is as an AAX plugin. And right now I'm just gonna go over some features. Later in the video, I'm gonna do some audio comparisons, but that's gonna take a little bit longer. So this section here is sort of dedicated to those who already know the plugin and just maybe wanna get into some of the more advanced features and new features that I'm uh, using. So my typical workflow uh, when using Pentio Pro Plus to decorrelate audio is putting it on you know, a stereo file that comes in. It's not always stereo. Sometimes it's ambisonic information. Sometimes it's 5.1 uh, stems, et cetera. But in this case, very common use is I'm putting it on a stereo file and then I'm choosing the 916 version of the plugin. And what that is doing is it's expanding the channel count of that stereo file in Pro Tools to a 916 channel width. Uh, and then I have the ability to have that as my max width, but I can also, as I'm going to show you in a second, I can choose to decorrelate to less, and I often do that. Now, that's being routed in my own workflow most of the time to a 916 object bed, which is a, a terminology that has been defined within our practice for some time, and that's the idea of channel-based object positions. Uh, great colleague of mine, Steve Jenowick, is the one who sort of, you know, established that term. The idea of putting objects in discrete channel positions uh, is the concept, the most commonly used concept for an object bed. In all reality, when we understand an object and the word bed, it could be any static use of objects. But in this case, pretty common use of the term for a 916 object bed means that I've got objects in those discrete channel positions. And then using Pro Tools, especially the more recent versions of it, that's a relatively simple thing to do. Now, of course, the LFE is going into the bed. That's always the case. So that those objects, those 15 objects, are dedicated for me typically to their own specific bed uh, of objects. And that's just for Pentio. And I'm not always using it in all my mixes, but when I do, that's there. And I've done some of that routing in templates already. Um, so that it's just a little faster. Now, I will say, this most recent version, and even one version before, I believe, the fact that we can just choose 916 in the Pro Tools, you know, with 916 channel widths is so much easier than it used to be, where we had to use ambisonic channels and basically cheat Pro Tools into accepting uh, larger than the previous 712 uh, channel width limitation. So I always just make it a 916, even if I'm going to use less channels, and I'll show you why. So here, I've got a stereo drum stem. I am going to explore the term stem and multi-track a little later, but this is a stem. It's a summation of a whole bunch of content. It's a stereo drum stem. Let's pretend that it came from uh, a mixer and I'm doing a spatial remix of a song. Now, I am putting, I am duplicating that drum stem, making a new Pro Tools track. So duplicating it and instantiating Pentio on it as a 916 instance. That is immediately giving me a version of that drum stem that is going to be upmixed to 916. But it doesn't have to be. There's all sorts of ways to manipulate this further, which is how I'm using it. Now, the new features, the key features that I'm using, especially now, but I had sort of workarounds for before, are things that I worked with Jeffrey to develop. And that's right here where it says upmix mode. Uh, you can see as you toggle over it that it'll actually explain. So 
U stands for standard upmix, which is how it used to work. Uh, S stands for stem upmix. And P stands for stem pass through. So when I am in U, means that when I press play, this particular drum stem, which is two channels, is going to now decorrelate uh, into all of the available channels. So a full 916, that's the default. I commonly turn the LFE off. I do not like to use the LFE for generalized content. I like to design LFE content very specifically in every mix I do. Uh, so I'm typically working with the LFE off here. I don't really want decorrelated LFE content. That's just me. You could have LFE content if you wanted, though. Um, now, what I used to do is I would then mute left and right, which are these two channels here, these two green ones. And what that would do is it would allow my original drum stem to play through into its own objects or into the bed, whatever I chose. And then Pentio is essentially giving me everything but left and right. Now, I'm going to explain this more as we go through the video later on, the idea of how that relates to immersive recording techniques, because that's where it's coming from for me. I am a recording engineer. I've spent a lot of time working on music and capturing it at source uh, for immersive audio and a lot of time thinking about it. And the project that I'm looking forward to sharing with you is all about that. But in instances where that's not possible because the music has already been recorded or it was conceived in stereo, which is all good, in these cases, I want to create decorrelated content. And again, we'll explore decorrelation, but the idea of sending the same signal to multiple places in an immersive mix is a no-no. It's something that has been learned in the art of surround mixing, in the art of immersive mixing from the very beginning. It does not create enveloping spaces. It creates volume increase. Um, the world around us is not experienced with the same sound coming from multiple places. We experience the world with decorrelated audio. It happens from reflections. It happens from reverberation. It happens from interference. And all of those things help us to localize and help us to have the experience that we have in the world. And therefore, taking a signal and bussing it to other speakers without any decorrelative, uh, you know, uh, algorithms or treatment whatsoever, it does not lead to strong immersive production. So in this case, if I wanted to have the drums present and strong and like their, let's say, original stereo version, as an example, in left and right, I can use Pentio to generate the rest of the channels for me with decorrelated content. Now, this isn't the only way to do it. We can do that with reverbs. We can do that with delays, Haas effects, so many ways to go about it. But I think especially when we do the audio examples later on, you're going to hear that what Pentio does is it, it generates phase coherent early reflections without long reverberation or late reflections. And so it's very, very unique. And it does relate a lot to how I approach contemporary recording techniques for immersive audio. So that usage case was like, I was doing it all the time. The idea of like stereo content and then decorrelate to 714 or 70 or quad or 916 or whatever. And I would just mute the channels like this. What I learned from through discussing with Jeffrey and Jeffrey Reed at Pentio and I have had many a phone conversation and gone back and forth and discussed you know, what this tool does, how I use it, why I use it. And what I realize is that when you're muting this here, the algorithm doesn't know you've done that. And therefore, it thinks that there's information coming out of left and right. I've just turned it off. Quite frankly, I could mute this after the fact with the trim plugin, for instance. It's the same. Therefore, there's actually a lot of wasted energy, a lot of wasted sound energy that is not being distributed among the other channels. And that is where the next mode comes in, which is stem up mix mode. Stem up mix mode says, I don't need to do this. Now, the left and right channel are going to not have audio come through them. And the algorithm knows that. Therefore, it's going to take what it used to put in left and right, which is usually pretty key information, according to the algorithm, 
um, it's not always assuming it, but it, I think it is it's assuming like a pretty, you know, forward facing kind of uh, mix approach for all sorts of logical reasons. And therefore, now that energy is being distributed by the algorithm, I can have my original stereo track and then I can have the decorrelated audio in the other channels while leaving left and right out of the scenario. Amazing. There's one more mode, which is P, which is stem pass through. Now, what this does is it combines the processes into one step. What it does is I no longer have to duplicate the channel. I can choose the P, stem pass through, and my original left right content will go through the plugin unaltered and everything else will be decorrelated. Unbelievable. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited that um, we worked on this and I'm, I'm honored really that they took the ideas and that they thought that they were good enough to integrate into a plugin. I will admit that although stem pass through seems like the obvious choice, I still am personally using um, the stem up mix mode the most. And here is why. I really like to manipulate my decorrelated content. And by that, I mean I like to EQ it in advance. I like to possibly have other effects involved so that I can even further decorrelate content. So I can manipulate the duplicate track a whole bunch before putting it into Pentio. I might roll off the lows, roll off the highs. It depends. It's completely content dependent. Another reason is, and this is not yet integrated at, a, at an official level in the plugin, but I don't just use this for left, right. I like to like I like to generate decorrelated content where my content is actually in the rears. In those instances now, I'm going back to my old school way of muting those channels. The algorithm doesn't know, but we are in discussion of integrating the ability to tell Pentio where you want your original audio and then for it to generate this decorrelated early reflection content intelligently based on where you have placed your other audio. For now, it's doing it with stereo. It's unbelievable. I will admit that if you go back and you use the original mode and you mute left and right, or for instance, if I put a something in the rear channels and I use it to, to generate decorrelated content el elsewhere, it still is absolutely functional. The big parts here is the fact that it's phase coherent on fold downs, right? Like, as much as I'm mixing in 916, I'm actually uh, in 1116 in this room um, because I do a bunch of work for film prep. Uh, so I have arrayed side speakers. But regardless, for music mixing, I'm 916. Even though I'm in this, this is not a speaker-based format unless I'm, right, if I'm talking about Dolby Atmos, which I am here, this is not a speaker-based format. It's an adaptive object-based format, and it's going to fold down to somebody somewhere. Um, if you don't want your music to fold down, then you present it as channel-based and you keep it that way. Totally respectable. Amazing thing to do. I love channel-based music. But if it's going to remain in the, in the Atmos ecosystem, the assumption that it will be fold down is something that we should take. And therefore, what I have, when, when Pentio came into my world, I'd tried every up mixer. I've tried most plugins, uh, especially in the immersive world, right? Just trying to create enveloping spaces, trying every day to to unpack that puzzle and serve the music and create meaningful, immersive content. And so when this tool came to me, the first thing I noticed is that the ability for it to not collapse when I um, collapse the image, when I, when I take the image and I put it into less channels. And, and so that's very, very powerful. Now, one other or a couple other little features here to explore. Just because I put it on a 916 does not mean that you have to generate that much content. I love creating quad content. It's awesome. I love creating, uh, you know, like here. There's, so here we can go to a 4.0. We can go to various uh, Atmos sizes, right? Like I might just want to have a 714. I might just want a 70. Or uh, there's there's all sorts of ways. And and what that comes down to really is about orchestration. And when I go into the next phase of this video, I'm going to talk about the art of immersive audio and the importance of spatial orchestration. It really is a huge part of the job. And as a composer myself, especially with the project that, that I'm working on that I'm going to share with you shortly, 
I went to the source and composed music and orchestrated it for this from the source. But really, even when I'm working on other people's music, that's what I'm doing. I'm orchestrating that music spatially. And so even if it's a, you know, initially a stereo production and I'm spatially remixing it, it is an orchestration job. It's also a whole bunch of other jobs all at once. It's a production job. It's a mixing job. It's a mastering job. But really, the spatial orchestration is where some of the most creative elements come um, in all immersive production. doesn't matter if it's Atmos or 360, Ambisonics, um, or discrete channel. If we get into electroacoustic music, um, acousmatic music, the whole like, the idea of the spatial orchestration. And so you don't need to create 916 content just because you can't. You need to think about what is this part and what do I want? And when I'm imagining it, I'm basically going to, if I had recorded it, how would I have done so? Now, I don't, you know, there's also the idea of reamping, right? Like, like putting sound out into a room. Um, there's lots of engineers who have access to big spaces to be able to do that. But that's also different typically because a lot of times if you're reamping, let's say, into a chamber or even a gymnasium, you are going to get late reflection, reverberant content. In this case, as you'll hear at the end of the video, or if you've used Pantio, um, that's not what it does. It's not a reverb plugin. I've got other things for late, for decorrelated reverbs, whether it's immersive or whether it's just doing mono sends. I do that all the time, just lots of mono reverbs and designing immersive spaces. This is not that. It's all about early reflections. And by generating the right balance of early reflections based on the source you, that is decorrelated, you can really create a sense of realism and envelopment um, and glue. Everyone talks about glue relating to compression, not an immersive. It's not the same. Glue is related to space. It's related to the relationship of sound and space to each other. And so I find that this is a tool that really leans into that. Before moving into the next part here, a couple other pretty cool features. Of course, you know, if anyone's never used it before, I also have the ability to control my side surround volumes. In, and when I do that, the algorithm knows, so it's adjusting sound energy, truly brilliant. Same with my rear content and same with my upper content, as well as center. There's also the new auto detect mono. Um, I don't necessarily always use that, but it's pretty brilliant. It's, it's saying like if there's a vocal and you wanna make sure that that energy just stays up front, it auto detects mono content and keeps it there, very brilliant. Um, the shelves. So this was uh, something that got brought in and I still often, I still often manipulate stuff before Pentio or after Pentio. However, the shelves are still quite valuable and the ability to have control and tonal control over different regions is quite brilliant. And there are times where I want to shelf up the highs or actually I just want the ceilings to be a little bit darker. The ability to do it all within the plugin is quite brilliant. Um, it also tells you, you know, as you shelf more and more, as you manipulate the sound after the algorithm, it will tell you when the down mix is not perfect, which is, it's awesome, right? The green goes red and tells you, hey, this fold down is not going to work quite as beautifully. Sometimes in music mixing, it doesn't matter. I usually am working on stuff that keeps it pretty 100% because when we get into headphones, and obviously the examples later on, we're going to listen in binaural. When we get into headphones, it's pretty important that it stays very phase coherent because we're already working in a binaural environment that has all sorts of phase anomalies. Um, and the last ones here are the diffuse uh, elements. Again, diffusion starts to bring in like reverberant, like er, like very, very short, but still like late reflection content. It's not what I'm using Pentio for, but I think it's cool that they put it in there. Um, and there's oh man, there's so many other features. I mean, there, there are other great videos out there as well that I would encourage you to, but that's where I'm at with this. Um, those are some of the new features. And uh, let's move on to the next part. Thanks, everyone. For anyone who's watched some of my previous content, you will know that I don't like to leave stones unturned, and I'd like to explore concepts as deeply as I can understand them. And so when we are talking about the idea of decorrelating audio uh, in, let's say, Dolby Atmos production or immersive production as a whole, there is the what and the how, but really what matters more than anything is the why. And the why of decorrelation is directly, for me, 
linked to the art of immersive recording and the art of creating enveloping spaces from the source. That's where it's coming from. And the use of these tools is searching for ways to create envelopment when immersive recording is not possible. So to start with the term decorrelation, right? Because I've, you know, that's, that's what Pentio is doing is, is it's decorrelating audio into larger channel count presentation. It's a great quote here from Gary Kendall from uh, Northwestern University. A process whereby an audio source signal is transformed into multiple outputs with waveforms that appear different from each other, but which sound the same as the source. What you see on the screen here is an article. You can search this article up. It's brilliant. It's, it's an article that goes into the depths of not, o not only the how, but the why and successes and failures of decorrelating audio. Gary goes into describing potential use cases, exploring use cases and some of their advantages and disadvantages, and talking about the why and the how of decorrelation. I think that it is important that we understand that when we're talking about music production as a whole, I cannot stress enough how important intent is in understanding what we are trying to achieve before just you know going for something, trying to understand what we're trying to achieve but then also understanding the techniques. In music production, there is the science and there's the art. The art is paramount. The art is everything, right? We're always, in, we're always serving the art. We should be. If you're not, think about it. We should be. But the science is there to help us serve that art properly. I have heard too often the concept that, oh yeah, immersive music, it's just the Wild West. I just disagree. Um, I'm not saying that there are not new aesthetic potentials, and I'm not saying that there are not wider potentials than maybe, you know, stereo production. But saying the Wild West undermines the amount of extremely well-researched material we have that defines the very foundation of immersive practice of immersive art creation. This goes all the way back to those who have been mixing in you know, quad and 5.1 for decades and have explored most of these issues before, maybe minus some of the adaptive object-based challenges. But from a, from a fundamental standpoint, from an artistic standpoint, we also go back to composers who have been doing this you know, hundreds of years ago who thought about spatialization in, in the artistic presentation to, to suggest the Wild West it, it undermines the fact that there's a history and that there's a lineage of knowledge and practice. And so for me, I am hungry for knowledge. I am always trying to learn. And so even before doing this presentation, I read this article again. It's amazing. It's really well thought out and it's, it's proper peer-reviewed research. I'm not saying that you need to have read a peer-reviewed research paper to make a powerful mix. No, that's not true. However, understanding the science helps us to inform our aesthetics, and it helps us to ground ourselves within this lineage that is immersive audio, and quite frankly, within this lineage that is music production as a whole. And so I'm going to say that, no, it's not the Wild West. It's a massive creative opportunity, but we, I feel that I have a responsibility to go deeper and deeper into the concepts and understand them, explore them, and that's the beauty of education. It's the beauty of the evolution of our species is the sharing and the moving forward of knowledge so that we can push art forward. And so I would encourage you to read this one and I'll give you a couple others uh, that might be inspiring as well. So we come to the art of immersive recording. Again, as I said earlier, this is the core of why I'm using Pentio to decorrelate sound when I can't have gone back to the source and have recorded it the way that I would have liked to. The art of immersive recording is essentially, you know, suggesting beyond two, two speaker uh, recording techniques, combinations of both coincident and spaced microphone arrays, and an array is a, a collection of microphones. There are many ways to go about it and to start that journey for anyone who A, already knows about it, or B, doesn't know much about it at all, I encourage you to understand it. Will you use it? Not necessarily, but it, 
it does help to know. It helps to contextualize what we're doing, and it also helps to contextualize where immersive audio comes from. Immersive audio starts as channel-based music, right? And then moves into this object-based world that we're in with, with um, Dolby Atmos, Sony 360, uh, various ambisonic formats, etc. But But really, it comes from channel-based music. And so understanding the root of it is very valuable, let alone the fact that it still is oftentimes uh, the best and strongest way to create envelopment. There's articles here from the DPA Mike University online. There's an introduction to immersive audio that also has other links to sort of continue the journey. And the great Morton Lindbergh uh, wrote this introduction to immersive audio. Everyone should read it. If you haven't read it, read it. Read it again. Read it again. And then click the next one and understand it. This picture here is of, you know, sort of a f the famous 2L array um, that has been designed and used for heavy artistic purpose by Morton who's created some of my favorite and most enveloping immersive recordings of all time. Um, those of you who know, I mean, I've been working in, in Atmos from around late 2015, getting into it, and then, you know, up and running in late 2016, 2017. When I first heard just immersive channel-based recordings, and some of Morton's were the early ones that I heard, they, you know, they ch it changed my life. It changed the way that I wanted to make music and how I related to recorded sound. So I encourage you to learn, um, and th that's a great resource. The next is uh, Hien Cook Lee. This article here, microphone, uh, multi-channel 3D microphone arrays. Um, this is in the Journal of the Audio Engineering Society, and you can follow this link to be able to read it. I met Hien Cook uh, this last summer in Huddersfield, at the Huddersfield University of Huddersfield, and it was an audio engineering society, the AES conference on spatial immersive audio. And I had the honor of, of presenting a topic there, but even greater of just attending the sessions by the brilliant presenters and spending time with that community in the in this uh, the great town of Huddersfield. And Hian Cook is, a, is a, a professor at the university there, an exceptional researcher, an exceptional engineer, a brilliant, brilliant mind and uh, someone I'm honored to call a colleague. And this article goes through, oh, it explores so many different approaches to using various microphone techniques, and it has informed me and continues to inform me. Once again, I just I just read it before doing this presentation just because like, oh, I should read this again, right? We, we just keep going deeper. We, we, we deepen the knowledge. And as an artist myself, I think of, you know, I've studied jazz music my whole life, and the great Charlie Parker, the quote there is, we learn the rules so that we can eventually let go of them. We gotta learn the rules. You gotta learn the systems because they've been placed there and they've been they've been thought out. This is all heavily peer-reviewed academic content that has been thought out by exceptionally smart people who have tried it and failed and succeeded many, many, many times. So I encourage people to look to the AES for learning to, you know, again, when I come to that that Wild West concept. No, go go read all the papers. Then let's talk about whether or not there are established aesthetics for a practice. It's The ocean is deep, and there's already quite a few islands that have been placed that you should visit, and these are a couple. Some influences I've already listed, you know, Morton. There's Leslie Ann Jones. Leslie is uh, the head of audio at uh, Skywalker Sound. You know, not even beginning to, to, to list the experience that she has in the world of, of film engineering and mixing. She has a couple immersive recordings that have that just floor me. And I've studied those microphone techniques and been at presentations where I had chances to ask her questions and, and integrate them into my own practice and just brilliant. Richard King, um, uh, engineer <laughs> for one of my favorite recordings of all time, which is the Goat Rodeo Sessions and just like countless beyond that. He was actually here in Toronto a couple of, like last week at an AES uh, presentation. We were very lucky. He's a, a professor at McGill University in Montreal and just a brilliant immersive recording engineer with a, with a great mind for it, but more importantly, a great aesthetic and a great ear. George Massenberg, you know, George's work, all the, of course, back to stereo and tape and important recordings, but also into, into where immersive audio is now continue to learn so much. Uh, Jim and Ulrika, so Jim Anderson and Ulrika Schwartz is, I've had the chance to be in many of their presentations, but in here in Toronto, AES, NAM, 
as recording engineers, just, just exceptional as mix engineers, exceptional as producers. I've really appreciated studying the way that they think about, you know, especially some of the contemporary music that they've worked on and, and sort of, you know, hybridizing classical recording, but within a whole uh, sort of, I guess, diverse set of music. Uh, he and Cook, I mentioned already. Florian Kammerer. So Florian is someone I met at, uh, who was a presenter in Huddersfield. And he presented his WFIX array. And the WFIX array, just look it up. Look it up, read his paper on it. The paper is out of this world. But I heard recordings where he personally went into, uh, you know, outdoor environments and location recording of the one that will never leave my never leave my memory and I can't wait to hear it again is is of a, a hailstorm in the jungle I mean we're it's I've I've always said like the, the thing that stuck with me there is the only thing that bothered me about that recording was that I wasn't physically wet is that I was hearing this thing and my body was saying wait a second I should I shouldn't be dry will Howie um a colleague someone I admire so much uh you know a friend and Will is, was a, a student at, at McGill and, and is really good friends with a couple of my colleagues, Jonathan Kochuk, a good friend of mine who made a record that I love called Every When, um, and uh, colleagues of mine at Humber College where I'm a professor, um, Andrew Mullen and Ryan McNabb. And so Will, Will has got an amazing mind for immersive audio. Not only is he understanding the arrays, but what I love about Will's philosophy that he shares with me is um, – He's very opinionated in all the best ways and explores really the idea of putting microphones where things sound great and designing very unique enveloping experiences that I admire. And as well as a lower level recording for things like up to NKH 22.2. And then Lessa Nipkow, I've also um, had chances at AES and NAM um, and also in Huddersfield and really appreciated his perspective and his skill as a, as a classical recordist. So again, the, I'm not even necessarily myself. Uh, I've done lots of classical recording, but that's not where I'm working these days, right? But this is the source for me personally, and I'm just sharing it. You know, this is, I'm sharing my gratitude for it, but also where the source is. And so now we come to my own take on it. Um, this video is not going to be the release of the project that I'm describing, but it is going to contextualize my own philosophy and it will link back to Pentio, I promise you. So I got into all of this because I want to make music this way. Um, those of you who know, I, I'm fortunate to be working in, in Dolby Atmos and Sony 360 with a lot of artists from around the world. I'm working on a lot of music in in both independent and major label spheres, but, you know, big records like um, Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style Records or um, working with Mother Mother or um, Brandy, the Arkells, Valley, Josh Ross, you know, sort of, you know, pop artists. Also in Sony 360, the opportunity to to do Olivia Rodrigo's Guts record. And so, so I'm working on a lot of contemporary music and a lot of frontline music. But in, like, you know, in here... I am a professional musician. I've been a professional bassist for my entire musical career here in Toronto at different points in my career, playing significant numbers of gigs and, and going on tour, et cetera, largely within like the sort of jazz, R&B, and world scene. And, and I've recorded a lot of music and, and written a lot of music throughout my life. And so I started a couple of years ago writing music specifically so that I could express my own musical vision in immersive and so here's a photo, for instance, of just uh, rehearsing in the space. And this is the Humber College studio, um, the Gordon Rag studio. And this is where I teach often. So I know the room and I experiment. And this technique is actually directly from Leslie uh, and Jones. This is three M149s in the front, two M150s to the side. Uh, and at different times, uh, there was also a, an M149 right in the middle uh, to try and generate some decorrelated LFE content. Uh, but also experimenting with close mics, far mics, everything that I could think of. And so testing, we did Hamasaki squares, we did uh, height channels, we, ch you know, various spaced arrays, changing all sorts of things. And when I say we, I now bring my colleague Alex Gamble into the picture. Alex is an amazing um, Atmos engineer and just music engineer here in Toronto. 
We do a lot of work together, and he is a co-engineer on this project with me, as well as my colleague at Humber, Ryan McNabb. And um, we did a lot of immersive testing in the space, just trying to figure out what does this space do? How do we get stuff out of this space? Eventually, uh, I established, and we established, the idea of a cardioid Sheps array. So this is an 11-channel array, very much in the in line with a lot of classical recording. And that is LCR, left surround, right surround, left rear surround, right rear surround, and then quad up top. This is an equidistant array from a center position, but all with cardioid mics, omni mics, and not hung up super high. Uh, it functions as a bit of a hybrid of both room and close mics, as well as ambient mics and reflection mics, very much along the lines of how I use Pentio. You can sort of start to imagine that this is basically what I want uh, when I'm using Pentio. And so the thing about this record is we did, last summer, we did 30 days of recordings, all overdub style, much more like a film project, even though it's a world, sort of contemporary world jazz record. Um, it's 30 days of recording. It's fully videoed. All that stuff will come later, and I look forward to sharing it with you. But every single day, every single instrument or group of instruments was captured with exceptionally, like, with very specific intent for where it wanted to be orchestrated in the music. If I want the horns in the back, I'm going to record them that way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have ambient captures or immersive microphone placements based on that. We were listening in 914 in the studio the whole time, producing for that in real time and making decisions all the way at source about how to place the musicians and how to record the musicians. So for instance, here's an oud, my good friend Aaron Lightstone, and the idea of the oud is not loud enough to engage a, an 11 channel array, but it does have a lot of very important transient content that for 4006s, as an example, um, did a great job for just lifting the instrument. Here's an example. Serengi, beautiful bowed Indian instrument, similar concepts, close mics, ORTF pairs further back that can be put in the wides, and then um, microphones up top. A tempura recording where three tempuras were recorded and everything. So every layer in this project has been very carefully captured with immersive intent. And so there's not one array Every day was a new combination of microphone placement based on what, what needed to happen for the recording and the production to bring the compositions and the improvisations alive. And then drum set, you know, I also the, the, in, the, the camera work here is, is huge because eventually, and I'll share more about this in, in future videos, the project's not quite there yet, but it's going to get there soon. Um, the array is behind the videographers, but this will all be released um, in movie theaters. You know, I'm, I'm figuring out the locations, etc. But the intent here is to create a cinematic immersive album. Uh, and it's well underway. We've done a bunch of testing and uh, pumped to share it with you. The art of immersive audio. Intent, spatial orchestration, envelopment, and being beyond any single format. Let's talk about this for a second. Nothing... No technique is right if it does not serve the music. And the way that we de the way that we best define that is by defining our intent. What am I trying to say? What image of this instrument or instruments or song or mix am I trying to convey? Am I trying to convey realism? Am I trying to convey hyperrealism? Where is the listener? What is the stage that I'm putting them on? What kind of feeling do I want to invoke? And that's where spatial orchestration comes in. And I talked about this earlier with the Pentio thing, and I'm going to talk about it again. Spatial orchestration is the idea of orchestrating parts and orchestrating elements of the music within this somewhat 360-degree space that we're mixing in. Whether it's in Atmos or 360, ambisonics, acousmatics, channel bass, doesn't matter. The spatial orchestration is definitely related to the format we choose, but the concept is bigger than that. And really, regardless of, of the intent, you know, we are trying to create enveloping environments. Now, envelopment is highly subjective, and there are a lot of different definitions as to what is enveloping and what isn't. Do I like this? Do I not like this? And that's all aesthetics. But envelopment is the word. 
Um, Morton Lindbergh has a great quote actually in that article, I, I believe, where you know the literal definition of immersion is the idea of being submerged in water as an example. That's not really, he said this, it's like not really what we're trying to do with music. Rather, we're trying to envelop somebody in the music. I love that. And I don't, to me, great. If it's classical orchestral music, fantastic. If it's if it can be done with a great pop song, fantastic. If it's rock music, or reggae music, uh, South Asian music, South American music, whatever. You know, the envelopment concept is largely related to our spatial orchestration and the approaches that we take to produce that music. And just one other quick statement here is that, yes, I'm focusing today on Dolby Atmos. Um, it is it is integral to define the playback experience, the intended playback experience, to make the best possible decisions at every step of the way. And the playback experience is sort of part of the intent. And it always sort of has been in art, right? And so by that I mean, because I knew that this particular project of mine is going to go to Dolby Atmos, because I enjoy working in the format, I find it to be a um, highly flexible delivery tool, it's cinematically exceptional, um, all of the above, because I made that decision, it affects the decisions I make for orchestration. It affects the decisions I make for microphone placement, right? I'm thinking about, and this is something that uh, Florian clarified in my brain in a way that was very helpful, which is we have to think of the reproduction angles of the speakers to design our capture angles. Because if we design our capture angles in relation to those reproduction angles, the closer they are, the more accurate the reproduction will be. If I place my microphones too wide and my speakers are too narrow, it, it skews the image. Where if I've placed them at the right angles, it will reproduce that image properly. So it's not to say that Dolby Atmos is the best array. It's just to say that if that's the array we're going to use, that's what we should do. And I think that the electroacoustic um, and acousmatic and ambisonic folks think this way too. They, all, they have to define at a certain point in their production process, their composition process, they have to define how they're going to decode this thing. Where are they going to present it? Is it going to be on a speaker array? Is it going to be an installation? Because that's going to affect the compositional decisions, the orchestration decisions, and some of the production decisions as well. Spatial remixing is a term that I use to describe the art of receiving a production that was originally conceived in another format, stereo, 99.9% .9 of the time, where I'm receiving a finalized master and content, stems or multi-tracks, and I'm being tasked to spatially remix that music. I'm remixing it in a spatial environment. And my job is very specific, and my intent is very specific. Now, the art of spatial remixing, because it is commonly for artists with you know, great commercial success, which is awesome. Um, it has certainly become a focal point of the immersive audio world. And it's great. I'm honored to get to work on any music. And I really don't think that any lane of immersive audio is better or worse. But I do think it's important to identify that this particular lane of spatial remixing is just one lane of it. And we have to understand that when we talk about the art as a whole. There's channel-based, there's ambisonics, there's acousmatic and electroacoustic composers, there's people working for film, um, there's those who are creating installation art in immersive. The sky is the limit, right? And so the idea specifically of spatially remixing stereo content in Dolby Atmos or Sony 360 is a very specific job. And I've been very honored to work with independent artists all the way up to you know a lot of major label artists um, on a daily basis to, to do this task. My task is complicated. It involves production, it involves mixing, it involves mastering, um, it involves the idea of making you know very calculated uh, and musical decisions around the orchestration of parts, but it also involves the intent commonly of having at least a relationship with the stereo master. Sometimes the intent is to be very close to it. Sometimes the intent is to create something new. That intent is not always the mixers to define. 
and therefore it's an art. And there's a whole bunch of elements to this practice that need to be considered when we look at this particular lane of immersive audio. It is in this area of spatial remixing that I am using Pentio on a regular basis, and that's why I'm bringing it up. And as we've already explored for some time now, what I would love is to go back to the productions at the source and capture more content, mic things differently, have more decorrelated or uncorrelated capture to be able to create natural envelopment that serves the music. It's not always possible. And quite frankly, that's all good. Whatever form needs to be taken to get the best out of music in a, at a production stage is what should be chosen. The process I've gone through or many recordists or producers who in the immersive realm, really, you need, you need artists who are on board with that as well. It's complicated. It's hard. There's a lot of challenges. I'm not saying it's easy in stereo either. I'm not. I'm just saying that there are more places equipped to do it. And so the as, the, as a result... It makes sense that these projects are recorded that way, produced that way, mixed that way, mastered that way. And then the art of spatially remixing them is very specific. Where Pentio comes in is its job for me is to help create envelopment within layers of that mix based on the content that's delivered. Now, multitracks versus stems. The great Bob Clearmountain has put out a call to action for us to use these terms properly. So I'm going to define them very quickly in my terminology. The multi-track is our original source material, typically post-edit, and you can imagine it being like a 24-track a, a tape, the, the unmixed content ready to be leveled, ready to be equalized, ready to be summed, ready to hit reverbs and delays, etc., but all unprocessed, edited, multi-track content. It can even be unedited, of course. But usually, if you're going to receive, go back to the original tapes from a mix. For instance, Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style record. That's what we did. We went back, the folks at Death Row um, baked the tapes, digitized that information. And now my job is not only to do a sound alike, which is completely remix the content while listening to the stereo master, everything, um, but also to then spatially remix and orchestrate the music. So that's coming from the multi tracks. Usually, you know, mono content, right? Stems, the, mo the best way to understand them for me is like the film world. A composer might have 400 or 500 audio tracks in their, in their film composition. The remixers and the re-recording mixers at uh, sound stages, they don't have time for that. They want five, maybe 10 stems, strings, percussion, uh, harmony, soloists, drums, synthesizers, effects, something along those lines, so that they have big picture content to move in and out while mixing in sound effects and dialogue. Those are stems. Those are subgroups of a lot of audio content. Those are sort of, you know, two extremes that I'll describe. Um, there is an in-between, and it's actually what I'm working with most of the time, and that is processed multitracks. And what I mean by this is the way that a lot of mixers are working because they know that they need to what they will say stem things out, and that's where the frustration with the terminology comes from, but regardless, they need to deliver the source material to some degree. Well, they've had to do that because a lot of artists need it for potential sync situations. A lot of artists need it for archival purposes, for potential remixes down the road, and potentially for live to be able to trigger different elements. Now, a lot of times in live, they do go to the stem level of subgroups so that a drummer only has to click, you know, one pad and it triggers all the background vocals as an example. What I see a lot of is full multi-track in the sense that I get every individual element, however they're processed. They include their reverbs, they include their effects, they include their processing, their equalization, their compression, etc. That's very common. I do also sometimes receive mostly processed multi-tracks and stems. So I've got all the BG voxes in one stem because that was being, let's say, put through a chorus effect or something like that. But then all of the guitars are separate process multitracks. And so I think that it is fair to understand that it's complicated. And at the end of the day, I'm, I receive a stereo master and I receive a whole bunch of source material. I'm going to call them stems for now. They're process multitracks and stems, but for argument's sake, I'm just going to use the word stems. We're going to imagine, in fact, you know what? 
record here on the bottom, Arkell's Laundry Pile. Great example where Pentio is a huge part of this mix. They mixed it on a board. They did a great job here at Noble Street in Toronto. Uh, the Arkells is a fantastic, award-winning Canadian band. I've been honored to work on their material with them. Um, they've, they're, they're amazing. Laundry Pile is a record where they went into the studio, they were together, there's a lot of bleed, they're just on the floor, and the mix style was appropriate. They used a lot of subgroups because they had a console and a bunch of effects and they wanted to get that vibe. So then they went back and they, you know, printed me stems, and they are stems. They are subgroups of instruments. So I get this beautiful content, this gorgeous album, but I don't get a lot of it. And it just wouldn't be possible to separate it out because it would lose the vibe, it would lose the integrity, and our intent was to be congruent with the Stereo Master. And, and that's a fair intent. And quite frankly, it's not really my intent to define. It's Universal Musics, it's the Arkells, it's mine, it's the original mixers. We have dialogue about this stuff and figure out what are we trying to do here? And so in this particular instance, a relationship, a direct relationship with the original stereo production is part of the intent. But I want to create something exceptionally enveloping. So I have limited numbers of stems, let's say maybe 10 a song, but I really want to maintain the energy. I want to maintain that sound energy. I want to make sure drums and bass are grooving. But I want also someone to feel like they're being hugged. That's what the record feels like to me, and that's what I want to create. This record, I did a lot of fancy work with Pentio on this. It's not just, you know, what I described earlier. It's, it's, it's even, you know, uh, doing all sorts of complicated things, the duplicates of the tracks, to try and create as much decorrelated material as possible so that I can have an enveloping mix that does fold down properly to headphones and smaller speaker systems. And Pentio played a major role for me in this record. And I'll describe a quick story. So it's like Sunday night, the Arkells uh, manager, who, who's awesome, uh, is like, hey, the band's coming to UMG. They have a, a great office here in Toronto. I uh, love it. And the team down there, they're all awesome. Uh, they're like, yeah, the band's coming in Monday. To, uh, if you can get us the masters by then, they'll take a listen. And they have a great 714 room. So it's like, yeah, fantastic. And I had written said, hey, I haven't seen them in a little while. I'd love to come by for the listening session. Great. So I send the masters off Sunday night. They're all there. I'm happy with them. I've QC'd them. Um, as long as they don't have notes, I'm good to go with them. Then Monday I write and say, hey, what's going on with the listening session? Just let me know what the timing is. He's like, yeah, yeah, band's here. Uh, why don't you come around like four o'clock? That's, that's the information that I was given. I was almost going to leave in my like sweater and borderline leave my sweatpants. But it's like, okay, I'm going to the universal office. I'll, I wouldn't have done it, but regardless. Am I ever happy I put on a button shirt and some pants? Because when I get there, it's a full press viewing, a release in their amazing venue called the Academy, which is this awesome 914 venue um, where you can sit like 50 or 60 people and listen to Atmos. And I get there, everybody from Apple's there, from Amazon, various streaming companies, a whole bunch of ARs, like everybody's there. This platter is like it's a full press release of the record. And they're gonna play the Atmos. I know, and they know, that I'm the only person at that point, other than a short little listening session, who has listened to that record in Atmos. I resp the, the trust there is serious, right? The trust to present their art that they've worked on for that long, but they were in this environment like, oh, well, why don't we use the Atmos? Justin did it, it'll be great. So I sit down. And I'm like, all right, well, here we go. And we listen to the record together, this whole group of people. And that's where, you know, the creation of envelopment, this is a big space. If I had kept it super safe in, in just in the front, it'd sound good in headphones and all that, but it would have just fallen flat in that environment. And this is why immersive audio is, it's bigger. Like we do have to create envelopment one way or another. But I also have the band there listening to their record that they created, that they signed off on in stereo, presenting it to a whole bunch of industry in real time, 
basically their first listen. And so if I've done something wild and changed the entire arrangement, that's not, that's not a good idea. That's not an appropriate thing for me to do without having confirmed it with them. And so it's complicated, right? This, these relationships is complicated. And so in that particular case, like it just, oh, one of the things that I loved about it is that everyone listened to it, even in the band, and everyone just talked about the music afterwards. They didn't talk about the fact that it was an Atmos or this was exciting or this was exciting. All I wanted to do was just create this hug. I just wanted the warmth of this music and the warmth of the lyrics and the warmth of the songs to just, just sort of cradle the listener. And even in this giant room, like pretty big space, and I don't know if you've experienced, but I have the challenge of taking mixes and playing them in larger spaces. When you rely on phantom imaging and things like that, things get really challenging really fast. Regardless, Pentio played a huge role there of, of helping to create decorrelated content while still allowing me to maintain required spatial orchestration to keep the harmonies and the grooves alive. So, and then, you know, they go home and they listen to it on headphones and they've got to feel the next day equally inspired by listening to it on Apple Spatial or on Dolby, uh, you know, AC4 IMS. The consumer scalability aspect of this is also a consideration. And so that's an, one example. And I put some examples here where, you know, Pentio is playing a role. Um, now, I've talked about Atmos the whole time, but my work on the Olivia Rodrigo stuff has only been uh, Sony 360. It's Prash Mystery and his team who have done the Atmos. Amazing job. And and he worked with me uh, as well as his uh, Fifth Elements, his, his uh, sort of partner in at uh, the tile, tile Yard, which is his studio, doing 360. And so in 360, I can also create decorrelated 13-channel material from the multi-tracks, the process multi-tracks of the stems, and I do. And so this is where Pentio, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not a take all my tracks and now put it through Pentio and everything's going to be fine. No, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to make it sound realistic and good, but it's a great tool. And sometimes I choose Pentio. Sometimes I do Haas effects with delays and reverbs. Sometimes I don't do anything. Sometimes I've got enough content, uh, you know, a nice busy mix that there's no room for that kind of decorrelation, it gets lost in the mix. Sometimes it's decorrelated reverbs. But I will say that what Pentio does is very unique, very powerful. And um, I hope I've described, you know, some con content for it. So here we go. Um, as I said, it's not really for late reflections or reverberations, but let's just get into it. I'm now going to open up a Pro Tools session and we're going to do a little bit of listening to close this thing off. All right, so here we are in a session that is a current mix session for me. I've committed some stuff uh, to make the processing more smooth while capturing things for video, but it's a current mix session for me from the Immersive Project. This is a song called Beyond. Let me give you a quick tour. So here are my drum tracks. I've got common, you know, typical close mics, great mics on everything here, uh, kick and snare, tom mics, um, a separate snare verb right now, Parallel for snare, hi-hat, ride, mono, uh, a mono sort of crush mic. Drum overheads are LCR, so three sheps, and a drum parallel bus. So that's, you know, some pretty common approaches to mixing a drum set. Then I've got my immersive 11-channel array, which we looked at a photo of earlier, which is a sheps MK4 cardioid array of 11 channels, 7 plus 4. I've also got some additional... DPAs way up in the ceiling, and some ribbon mics, some Coles 4038s, uh, intended to sort of be rear-ish rear content material, uh, faced sideways so that the null points are towards the kit, and I'm really looking for reflections. So that's an example of drums. There are 39 channels in that drum set. That level of precision and, and immersive recording intent is on every single track. Some of these songs, there's eight songs on the record in, uh, in total, have upwards of 500 audio streams at any given time. The, the music, as I'm not presenting the music today, we'll listen to a little excerpt, but as it comes over time, there's about 40 musicians involved. We recorded for 30 days. Uh, I've also been doing some later overdub kind of con content. And so bass trombones, similar concept. I've got close and I've got uh, arrayed content specifically for them to be placed behind me. Same thing for the brass quintet. Same thing for tabla. 
Although with tubla, it's not so much of an immersive instrument, so I've recorded, you know, one tubla per speaker commonly. Uh, the Woodwind Trio, same concept, except this time this is very much uh, inspired by Leslie Ann Jones, the decatree with my 150s and then also 4006s uh, way up as quad uh, overhead immersive capture. String section, soloists, piano, guitar solo, where I've got three amps in the room and I'm capturing immersive content. Um, Serengi is a beautiful boat instrument with the 4006s over top. Everything has been recorded with this level of immersive intent at source. I'm just going to play an example. Again, this is not a final mix, but it's, it's getting there. And how we're listening to this right now, you got to put on headphones. If you don't, it should still sound pretty good. But realistically, this is an immersive project. There is no stereo comparison. This is what it is. So we are listening through the Dolby Atmos renderer. Um, this is largely right now in a place where it's, it's appearing very much like a discrete channel 916 presentation. There are a few objects in a different songs. I, I'm changing that up a little bit, but largely it was designed and orchestrated for 916 and that's how it's being presented. So, but I am using many different 916 object buses for reasons that I'll explain in future videos. So you're hearing it through the binaural render. The render modes are largely set to mid, but a couple are set to off because I find that with all of this various content, that's the translation that it's working. I actually don't use off very often, but in this particular context, you know, I'm always trying whatever helps the AC4 IMS to translate. I will admit at this stage of the production, I am designing a speaker-based experience. Um, but I think when you design a good speaker-based experience with proper decorrelation, it can translate very meaningfully to headphones. So we're just going to listen to a short example, and then I'm going to solo the drums, listen to the drums with the array content, and then solo the drums, listen to the drums with Pentio, and we'll have an example of how to use it. I even designed a VCA fade in and fade out for everybody just to keep it classy. That's an example of just a head in to a song to contextualize some of the music. In headphones, we're having an enveloping experience according to the binaural. In speakers, this is an, ex this is an exceptionally uh, immersive design and, and uh, I look forward to sharing it that way. But for now, to demonstrate Pentio, here's what I've uh, decided I think is functional. I'm going to solo the drums. I'm going to play the drums right now. This is the, the original drum set. So that means close mics and immersive array content of the drums. Here we go. OK, now I'm coming down and I'm going to mute the array or the room content. Oops, sorry about that. Here we go. Close mics only, bringing the array back. Hear that reflection content? A little bit of tail, but it's pretty short room, so pretty much reflections. Array off. And array back on. Not reverb. That is just using the immersive capture to, to use that room to present the drum set with the sense of spatiality that suits the song. I still want the closeness. I still want this to feel groovy. By the way, that's my brother, Derek Gray, playing drums. And, but, I, but I want all that immersive content. And now I can pan it in the front and also have everything else that I want. And, and that level of detail, I can also, of course, turn the array up or turn the array down, depending on how spacious I want it. So in the solo, the saxophone solo, I'll ride the array and, and push it up. 
So that's that sound. Here's what I've done to demonstrate Pentio. I have summed the close mics of the drums to this stereo processed multi-track, or realistically, I'd call this a stem because it is a, an amalgamation of a lot of channels, a drum stem. I have duplicated that drum stem onto another track. I've instantiated Pentio as a 916. I have, however, set that to 914 because I don't necessarily want the messiness of the transients in the center top because that can sometimes cause some some fold down issues. I'm fine with the 914 presentation here. And I'm just trying to reproduce what I did with the array plus those uh, coals and DPAs uh, in the room. Now, I'm not going to use this in this mix. I already have the immersive intent content, but I can play this for you because it's YouTube and it's my music. So uh, it's one of the reasons I chose this, but I'm also pumped to, to show it to you. So now I have also chosen I'm going to choose stem up mix mode, which is S. This is going to mute the left and right channels in the algorithm, right? Uh, and it's going to distribute the energy to everything but left and right. And that's because I've already got left and right in the drums. So here's the close mics as a stereo drum stem. Here's Pentio. Right? Check out the Atmos renderer as well. You can see that Pentio engages the, a similar concept to the array. Here's the drum stem, and here's me adding Pentio. Right? Off. On. Oops, sorry, and both. Off. Let's go back to the immersive version very quickly. Here's drums, array off, array on. Right, we hear this, this beautiful space come in. Okay, uh, stereo stem, Pentio. It's not quite the same, of course, right, because I, I it's not the same room. The, the, the room that I recorded in does have a little bit of a tail. It starts to get into that long reflection kind of territory, right? Because it's a big, it's a big tall room, and, and those microphones are spaced appropriately. But this is the concept, a simple example of taking the drums and developing immersive content for it. Now, what I could also do is choose to have this only be 714. I could choose to have this only be quad. That's all spatial orchestration. I could also, if this wasn't drums, I could pan it to the back and then mute channels and develop other decorrelated spatial content. And now if you happen to have watched the whole thing, and I know it's a relatively long video, but there's a lot of information. I hope it's helpful. If you've watched the whole thing, you understand now what I'm trying to do with this. I'm trying to essentially reamp but not for late reflections, not for reverberant content. I'm not trying to put this in capital chambers or try to put this in a gymnasium and get, you know, a bunch of omni mics up and, and get reverb. I'm trying to get reflections. I'm trying to generate realistic reflections that spread the instrument in a way that feels realistic while allowing me to keep the main direct sound present and controllable. I want them to be separate and I want to be able to manipulate them. Now I might further EQ this, like, and, and let's do a little demo here. So again, stereo, drums. I'm gonna bring up the side surround content. I'm going to bring up the rear surround content. We get a little, like, a little bit of a darker texture behind us, right? Off, on. I'm going to bring the heights up. Height in binaural, it's the most challenging thing to uh, to represent, right? But in, in an immersive speaker system, this is something that would be felt. But note that it, as I brought up that volume, it didn't start to collapse, right? And that is no small thing. To be able to maintain the integrity, the phase alignment of this source 
while creating and enveloping speaker mix at the same time is no small feat. And it's something that I'm grateful for because it means that, yes, are the headphones representing this mix in 916? No. And this time, I could say it. Um, I'm going to explore this philosophically a lot more as I share more about the Immersive Project. But this time, this is my music. I wrote it. I conceived of it. I, I produced it as a part of recording it. I'm mixing it. And so this is my intent. The intent is the speaker delivery. That's it. That's what I want to create for people. But, of course, there's a practicality when I want to share it on YouTube or I'll put it on streaming that I want it to be a meaningful music experience in headphones. Is it the same? No. I'm going to create as many immersive playback environments with cinemas and immersive uh, speaker uh, playback scenarios as possible. There's also full 4K video to accompany it. But for now, as a creator... I'm just thinking about that. And therefore, for me to be able to have this much immersive content, but also something that doesn't collapse or completely destroy a headphone mix is very powerful. And I think it is important for us to recognize that as headphone rendering continues to grow, the speakers is the master. We need to make the speaker mix the best we possibly can. But I disagree that we should ignore the headphones because if I'm working with an artist who's got a song out on Friday, their listeners need to experience it on Friday, not three years Friday, Friday. They need to be moved by it. And if they happen to choose my Atmos mix or they're listening to the Atmos mix and they don't even know what's happening, I want them to connect to that artist's song. That's the job of the spatial remixer. So if I can create a world where if someone listens to it on speakers, they're really moved. But if someone simultaneously listens to it on headphones, they are moved, even if maybe not with the same level of envelopment, with the same level of musicality, that's a success to me. And so here's an example. I know it was a long journey to hear that. So I'll do a few more audio examples here. Um, a, a long journey to, to get to this, but that's just one example of using Pentio to create decorrelated content when working from stereo uh, sources. So here's the drums again. Stereo. Here's Pentio. I'll bring up the center content. We get a little more front energy. I'll bring up the side content. I like the side content here, and I really like the rear content. It's darker, and it, it gives a sense of depth to the instrument that I like. I am almost always leaving the LFE off. I'll explain that in a second. Now, if I was to make the uh, 
rear channel's diffuse, we get tail, right? So it starts to become an immersive reverb. The issue is that's not what I'm trying to use Pentio for. I've got all the other reverbs on this that I can, can pull of, pull from. Um, it's cool that it's there, but it does affect the down mix. And the more that I listen to this in various headphone formats, the more I listen to it in 5.1, the more that I check that and get sensitive to it, the more I like to maintain the phase coherent down mix principles of this uh, tool. Lastly, the LFE. I like to design my LFE content very specifically based on the mix. I like it to be decorrelated from all the content, and I don't like to just feed it information. Therefore, I'm, I'm almost always turning the LFE off in Pentio. It's very functional, um, but I'm, I'm not really doing it. And in general as well, I will, I'm going to experiment more, honestly, with the auto detect mono. This is a new feature. It's a pretty cool concept, but I haven't yet found that it's necessary because I really do want to decorrelate. I want to spread this information. So I don't want to necessarily hold information back. Um, and I do have the center channel, you know, to be able to, to be able to adapt how much center presence there is. So in, in general, I'm not there yet with that particular feature. I hope you enjoyed. I hope uh, we learned. I did. Anytime I explain something uh, or attempt to explain something like this, I learn a lot. And I look forward to continuing to stay in touch. I look forward to sharing this music with you. And I look forward to you getting a chance to try this out. Let me know what you think. Let me know how it's working for you. Um, post in the comments and do please subscribe. Let's keep in touch and uh, happy mixing, everybody.